power of music is something that's around for everyone. Everyone remembers where they were when I particular piece of music. And that's what I've been involved in. Bill, there's a remarkable array of microphones here. I believe this one is rather special. Yes, yeah, well, that's my father um, bought that for me for five pounds then in 1943 or four. Yes. Uh, at an electrical shop in Carnegie. And uh, it's actually made in Melbourne. As it turns out, it's made by the Steen Sound System Company in West Melbourne. And I ended up getting a job there some years later, wiring up amplifiers. So when your dad bought you this microphone, what are you using it for? Uh, well, I'd actually built a, a disc cutting machine when I was at uh, tech school in Caulfield Tech. You were allowed in the machine, it was in those days, a tech school was a machine shop, had a blacksmith shop and all that sort of <laughs> stuff. So I was able to make some bits and pieces and another friend of mine, Neil McRae, technical engineer, um, built an amplifier, amplifier for me and taught me how to uh, build amplifiers because in those days you couldn't buy anything made. Um, and so we ended up between him and myself making a disc cutting machine and uh, hook up the microphone to it and on my, uh, the back veranda of my home we had a piano sitting in, in the enclosed part of the back veranda and, and the jazz musicians uh, like to hear themselves, so that's how I got very much involved with them and, who, and recording. Who were some of these jazz musicians? Oh, Frank Johnson, the Bernard brothers, Bob Bernard and Len Bernard. Uh, they were all the same age as me. They, they were all starting playing jazz all over the place and they wanted to hear themselves. So this is late 40s. Yes. They come round to your house and in, they set up on the back veranda. Yeah. Uh, inside, it was an enclosed veranda. Yeah. yeah. And uh, that's the start of it all. Brilliant. Now yeah. then, tell me the, the, the story through to, uh, let's get to the recording studios, but a little bit of time at 3UZ. Yes. Uh, and then 3DB. At 3DB, I was a recording engineer there. Right. And I also, because you were at a broadcast station, if you're an engineer there, you've got to do the footy as well. So, oh, really? So I'd go to the footy with Lou Richards <laughs> to uh, to call, be calling a, a game with on 3DB. Yeah. And in those days, there's no great enclosure for uh, <laughs> the broadcast. <laughs> it was just a tin shed on the side of the, the ground and a couple of bits of wire hanging out and you go down there with your little telephone and... Yeah and a uh, microphone and off you go. Now tell us about W and G Records. I had started my own record label and then uh, it uh, uh, wasn't doing well and W and G were pressing my records. I had ordered a Neumann cutting machine, which is on its way to me, but I didn't have any money to pay for it. So W and G very kindly said, look, why don't we buy all your equipment and you come and work for us and uh -huh. set up our cutting room and uh, that's what I did. So I was there for a number of years. It became obvious that uh, WNG was developing with Ron Tudor there. And um, I helped them, as, uh, found a place to build a studio around the corner in a, in a church hall. We leased the hall and, and then um, built a studio inside the hall, the sound room. It was really like, a, yeah. like a box inside the box. Um, and that was there for many years. Um, and who did you record there? Well, I was mainly recording commercials and those days were very big. The jingles. But, yeah, jingles business was very big with Bruce Clark and Tom Davison. And then I left there um, to go back on my own and down to Telefill Studios. Yes, now Telefill Studios, which was in St Kilda, yes, and it's now the Mimo Music Hall. Yes, it was the old Hoyts Memorial Theatre, and uh, that's why it's called the Memo, obviously. Yeah, um, and uh, 
people before me, I don't quite sure how it worked out, but uh, uh, it, it was a lot of enthusiastic people had started it and set it up very well. Uh, technically, but they weren't doing much business. So uh, who were you recording at Telefilm? Well, normally Roe was, uh, ain't necessarily so, is the only one I can claim that I recorded that was famous. Um, it's not a bad there, claim. There, there, were, there were a lot of other, Bobby and Laurie. Um, oh, Hitchhiker from yes. Bobby and Laurie, was yeah. that recorded there? Yes, yeah, and all these, um, and they were uh, recorded uh, Roger Savage had turned up in Australia. Now, he had a bit of form, didn't he, Roger Savage? Yes. Uh, he, he'd he recorded uh, Mick Jagger's demos. He was a, senior, a junior engineer at Olympic Studios. Yeah. And uh, then he uh, met an Australian girl who was uh, uh, at, at the, at the uh, recording studio, Olympic. And uh, that's how I got to know him because Frank Johnson, the band leader from Australia, had met him somewhere and said, if you come to Australia, you've got to go and check Bill Armstrong out. Yes. And uh, he came and uh, worked with me at, um, uh, at Telefil for quite a while and then... And did he bring a whole lot of new ideas? Yes. I mean... When you say new ideas, they were... His, uh, his, he was good at what he was doing in London. Yes. Which we didn't... I certainly wasn't good. I was a jazz recorder. I could record bands and big bands, and yeah. but I, I had no idea of how to record uh, rock and roll. Yeah, and he was uh, the master of it. And then he, uh, when I left Telefil to start my own studio, he joined me there, and uh, he was in, involved and taught young engineers. Bill, let's move to Albert Road. Well, I decided to um, break out of Telefilm and start my own studio uh, because um, commercials were the big business then, not rock and roll or anything like that. But, uh, and I um, picked this spot in, in Albert Road. I did a survey of all where all the advertising agencies were and everything pinpointed to this little Point in, in Albert Road. Really? Very uh, crafty. A little, little block of a like a stretch of land. Channel 7 was in the same corridor of land right. that where uh, you could have a broadcast station or a studio, which 7 was, um, and it was a pit permitted area because there were lots of areas that were terrific, but that you could not have a, right. a, a, a recording studio in them. So that I... I um, wandering along Albert Road one day and a little, funny little guy is, is mowing the lawn outside and I said, oh, do you know anybody along here? I'm looking for a, a renter house or something along here. And he said, oh, give us your name or something. And he, uh, it ended up that he ended up owned half the bloody street. Because <laughs> <laughs> I got a phone call from his wife a couple of days later saying, Oh, 100 Albert Roads come up and you can have it for 18 pounds a week. So uh, we didn't have a contract or anything. <laughs> and did you and tell him what you were going to do with oh, the yeah, house? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Make yeah. it into a recording studio. Yeah, yeah. So um, then I uh, got, uh, my brother was a builder, brother Ted, my oldest brother. And I said, I've just taken this little funny little place and uh, I want to knock a couple of walls out and do that. And he was a builder, so being a good big brother, he pulled all his men off a job and in a couple of days I had a studio. Wow. <laughs> that, that was the main studio for a long time. And that, who did you record there? Oh, Brian Cadd, Little, Little River Band, Farnham. Uh, Is that where Sadie happened? Sadie was there. And in fact, is, you've got a, another connection with Sadie. Didn't you know the real Sadie? Yes. Mrs Cook was our cleaning lady, but it wasn't a real name because I didn't think she paid tax. <laughs> but uh, um, she, we used to call her, uh, after the song became famous, we called her Sadie and after a while she realised it was a big hit, she didn't mind being called Sadie. Right. So who had the idea to write the song? David Mackay was a producer from EMI Sydney. Right. 
And uh, he didn't like to record in their studio in Sydney because it was a bit, the engineers up there were a bit potty dotty and they wouldn't wouldn't let you play loud music and do it. Really? Oh, the, the senior engineer there even went as far as having a, uh, a, a, a sensor on it and a bell rang if they turned the volume up too much in the control room. I mean, it was quite ridiculous. And and so we got, you know, with Roger Savage, I Belong With You by Bobby and Laurie was, uh, you remember that one? I do. Uh, yeah. Now, Roger recorded that at Telepill uh, with me oh, and um, David Mackay was the senior, the producer at EMI in Sydney as he relates himself, he says he's driving home one night and he listens to this, I belong with you, and he couldn't believe it was made in Australia. So from that one, that one lean to her and he came down and recorded everything with Roger at my place or our place. Great. John Farnham had a little band called um, Strings Unlimited. Yes. And he came about 70 years old or something, came and plumber's mate come in to record this little band and uh, David Mackay heard him, and but also Peter Best, who was a jingle writer, one of the best. He was just doing a set of commercials for Answered A and A with a girl called Susan Jones. It was a whole thing about Susan Jones's meter on every flight and all that, and he'd written this beautiful song, uh, and uh, they were looking who's going to sing it. it was Farnham. The first thing uh, Farnham did was a commercial was for a commercial. Susan Jones. Uh, John Hawker did the arrangements and um, they did it as about three, like a rock and roll and, and there was strings and was different styles yeah. of Susan Jones. Uh, so that was the beginning of Farnham. And Sadie came... And then, and then David Mackay signed Farnham up. Then Sadie came after that. Right. Except that uh, uh, it, 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 it was just it was the beginning of life for him. It was a massive hit. Bill, tell us about the equipment at Albert Road. Well, I started off with the uh, mono tape machines made in Roller, made by, by uh, Roller Company in Melbourne. Yeah. Uh, then I went to, to two track and then four track and then um, uh, an eight track machine uh, was the next one. And I figured that we were, we were working we were re being recognised because of Roger's work and that. Uh, I took a punt on um, the Scully Company in New York were making an eight-track one-inch tape machine and I imported uh, this eight-track machine um, from uh, Scully and I had all the drawings set out for the cabinet and they air, -mail, air, air freighted the, the machine out we got it on Friday and we had it working on Monday and um, we had a, we were the only eight-track studio outside of America at that time. Really? They did, uh, at uh, Abbey Road didn't have eight-track, they had four-track studio machines. But uh, And this is when the Beatles are recording? Yes, yes. So we had an eight-track machine. <laughs> In the case of a Scully machine, only one outside of America. If something goes wrong, you're in real trouble. Yes. So Graham Circle's a, a, a brilliant engineer um, and uh, he kept us going with uh, the machine, which was actually, I would put it like a hole and this just keeps going. It kept going. I and mean, then was there a 16 track? Yeah, yeah well, well uh, Graham was also, uh, at the, it was, had made uh, machines under his own brand name called Optro, which we had a couple and he developed a 16-track tape machine made in Oakley and um, we bought two of them and um, they were brilliant and the specifications were technically better than Ampex and American wow. ones but, uh, but, but in a small way because he couldn't compete with uh, large yeah. companies like Ampex. Of so course. But... The machines were brilliant yeah. and uh, we ended up with, uh, in, I think, about four machines between there and when I moved to uh, uh, Bank Street Studios. Tell us about that move. You left Albert Road. Did you want to be no, well, the, bigger? The, the, as business grew, 
uh, the same chap that I rented that from owned half the houses and every, as one became vacant, I took it. So we ended up, I, ended up, I started with 100 Albert Road and I took 96 Albert Road, which is a two-storey place. Then I took 110, 112 and 118 <laughs> and I put my office up a bit further up. So we, and I took a lease on the building behind us in, in Palmerston Crescent. So I had an eight-track studio there, an eight-track in, in Albert Road and, and four-track. We had so many machines going all over the place. Because I was renting all these buildings next to each other and um, in those days, the PMG, which controlled every telephone in the world at that time, um, if you wanted to uh, run a, a, an audio cable between building A and B, you had <laughs> yeah. to actually physically go out to the street, get the PMG to run a, along the street and then into the next building. We thought, you know, we, 16, 16 pairs, uh, you know, we can't handle all that. So what we did is we, we bought a tonne of, of a screen cable and um, had these uh, 16 tracks, 16 cables taped together across the backyards of all the people <laughs> in between us. And so we had these, these massive cables running between 90, uh, 100 Albert Road down to 112, down to Palmerston Crescent behind us, immediately behind us quite illegal, but if if you wanted to transfer something from the machine in one room, yeah. one building to another, it would have been impossible. You and you're working flat out. Yeah, flat out, with, yeah. With bands. Bands and 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 because rock and roll was developing. Yeah. Uh, so this is, what are we now, 72, 73? Yeah, somewhere about that, yeah. yeah. What I did with the number 96, the two-storey house there, I figured if, if um, if I help the jingle writers, I'll get the gig. So I gave them a, a room and a telephone free, yes, and and free use of the studio to make their demos for advertising agencies. And that made it good for them. Yeah. Provided I got the we got the recording got gig. Yeah. And that worked very well. So. Uh, well, uh, who else would you work for? But Bill Armstrong. <laughs> I don't know, well, it, everything evolved and not serious thinking about much except just to do it. I had to, we figured, well, I've, I've got to get out of this. So we, I looked, looked around to, um, for, for a building that might be okay and uh, I looked at all sorts of places but uh, in the end, 100, uh, 180 Bank Street, uh, was a st standout so we could build the studio then. And where was the real thing recorded? Albert, Albert Road. Road. What do you remember about that oh. session? <laughs> I remember, <laughs> it was a bit hard to forget. Uh, Molly was um, in charge of that, EMI. Uh, Guy Cliff Baxter was the manager of EMI at that time. We were recording and John Sayers was the engineer working at my place at that time. Um, and Molly was uh, apparently taking forever producing it. And the, the, the bill was going up, up and up and up and up and Cliff backs the ring. He said, look, get it finished, lock Meldrum out and don't let him in. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah. So that was in the middle of the song. So the real thing is being recorded. It's in production, yeah. But did you have a sense that something special was being recorded? Because it's really one of our iconic it songs. Is. Well, look, at that time I don't know. I, I couldn't say that yeah. because I, I, it, it became one. Yeah. Uh, and they threw everything at it, didn't they? Yeah. People doing voiceovers and Brian Cadd reading off the backs of tape. Yeah, and, and uh, boxes. some old recordings of Hitler yes. on the end of it and uh, things like this. And... Um, and also it ran over the two and a half minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And up until that time, until Hey Jude came on the market yeah. by the Beatles, where up until then, two and a half minutes was all the rockers and people, everything yeah. had to be two minutes, two and a half minutes yeah. or, or it wouldn't get airplay. That's right. Uh, 
And the Hey Jude came out and it's seven minutes or something and everything I said, oh, it's all right. So, yeah. so the real thing yeah, of course. went longer. So we're at Bank Street now. What were you doing then? Were you just... I was, I was what they call managing. <laughs> <laughs> but what did that involve? Oh, running, a, running a place. Right. So, and, and stressful? Yeah, we had a fairly large staff and mm. uh, uh, just just uh, just managing the place and mm. and we had terrific people working for us. It was a fun place to work at. I mean, it was. That's the difference, as you you know that. Yeah. And you go into places and it's it's a fun place to be and it's not yeah. a not a very strictly organised no. place. Very disorganised at times. So, Bill Armstrong, look, it's been a real pleasure speaking to you. Is there one particular memory that, that you hold dearest above all? I look back on everything and think that uh, the uh, power of music uh, was what, which uh, was the most important thing it, from the very early listening to... Um, 78 records in the in the early 30s till now I've been pushed well, well, guided by my love for, for music and uh, and I as I mentioned to you many times uh, the power of music is something that's around for everyone everyone remembers where they were when a particular piece of music and that's what I've been involved in just creating that piece of music that probably uh, lots of people love and remember. And I'm just uh, grateful I've been a part of um, the music industry. <laughs> Good on you, Bill. Thanks. <laughs>